Hello everyone, welcome back to another Bio in a Bottle AP Unit Review. Today we're going to be going over Unit 2, which is Cell Structure and Function. This is Topic 1, uh, which we're basically going to, going to go over the functions of each organelle. So before I begin, I want to go over compartmentalization. So this basically allows for each of the organelles to have its own specific function. And um, our membranes assist in compartmentalization and it al the membranes allow for the surface area to be increased and it also separates the um, organelle from the external environment. I believe that compartmentalization has originated from an endosymbiotic relationship and if you do not know what endosymbiotic relationship is, it's basically where one organism um, lives within another. So in this case, the prokaryotic cell lives within another and these prokaryotic cells, which lived within another, they eventually evolved to become the organelles we know today. So the first organelle we're gonna be going over is a ribosome. And this is not membrane bound. It is not a membrane. And they're found in all forms of life, whether it's eukaryotic cells, prokaryotic cells, animal cells, or plant cells. And they're basically responsible for creating, for protein synthesis in which it uses the mRNA to create a protein chain. And they're composed of an RNA and a protein. And these ribosomes can either be free floating within the cytoplasm or they can be attached to another organelle in which it can be attached to the rough endoplasmic reticulum, which gains its name from the ribosomes attached to it. And the rough endoplasmic reticulum, it's gonna be responsible for a uh, protein folding and transporting molecules through vesicles, and it also assists, assists in compartmentalization. And it's moves and the plasma reticulum on the, other, on the other hand. It's going to be involved in detoxification and lipid synthesis. And the Golgi complex, it's basically what's going to be transporting our proteins and packaging them, and it also further modifies proteins. And the mitochondria, it's basically responsible for all the energy within the cell, and it synthesizes ATP within um, the inner membrane, which is folded, which allows for a large surface area. And um, the membrane is not smooth and folded. And it, the double membrane, it allows fertilization. And the mitochondrial, mem mitochondrial matrix, which is shown here, it's responsible for, for carrying out the Krebs cycle. In lysosomes, they are membrane-bound organelles. They contain hydrolytic enzymes. And basically, lys lysosomes, they're responsible for apoptosis, intracellular digestion, and recycling of cells' organic materials. And vacuoles are, which is shown here, it's basically responsible for storing and releasing waste products. And it also assists in turgor pressure, which is what pushes the plasma membrane of a plant cell against the cell wall. And chloroplasts, they have two outer membranes. And I mean, they have two membranes and they're basically composed of the outer membrane, inner membrane, thylakoids, which are these disc-like shapes that you see here, which are organized into these stacks called the grana, and which are surrounded by the stroma, which is a liquid surrounding it. And the stroma, it's responsible for carrying out the Calvin cycle, while the thylakoids they are responsible for conducting photosynthesis. Next, we're going to be going over cell size. So surface area to volume ratios within a cell, they're very important. It affects that they can get rid of waste products, how they gain and lose thermal energy, and how they exchange energy and chemicals with the surrounding environment. And the surface area of the plasma membrane, it's very important. And small cells have a high surface area to volume ratio. And as the volume increases, the surface area decreases, and the need for resources also decreases. And as organism size increases, the surface area to volume ratio decreases. And next, we're going to be going over plasma membrane. So I, as I explained in the last unit, phospholipids, which are these individual individual um, molecules here, they have a hydrophilic head and a hydrophobic tail. This means that the head, it interacts with water while the tail does not. Therefore, the heads face the external and internal environment, which holds water, while the hydrophobic tails, they face each other. 
as they do not interact with water. And the plasma membrane will typically have proteins embedded within it. And these proteins can be hydrophilic with polar and charged side groups, while they can also be hydrophobic with nonpolar side groups. And the cell membrane can also contain glycoproteins shown here, as well as glyco glycolipids shown here. And next we're gonna be going over membrane permeability. So basically the membrane regulates what comes into and out of the cell. And the cell membrane separates the cell from the internal and inter external environment. So how it's regulated is that small and mo nonpolar molecules, they can freely pass through the cell membrane without a transport protein or without embedded proteins. So they don't need these transport channels and embedded proteins to pass. They can pass without them. While large and polar molecules or ions, on the other hand, they cannot freely pass and they will most likely need a transport channel or embedded proteins to pass. And polar and uncharged molecules, they can pass through the membrane as well, but they must, but they require small amounts to do this. As I was saying, um, polar and uncharged molecules, such as H2O, they can pass through the cell membrane, but they can only pass through it in small amounts. So the cell wall also has an effect on slug permeability as it provides an additional barrier which separates the internal environment from sub some substances. I'm going to be talking about membrane transport. There's passive transport and there's active transport. So at passive transport it occurs in the absence of energy because it goes from an area of high concentration to low concentration. And there's a mistake in my slides here, but this should be low concentration to a high concentration. So just keep that in mind. It should be low and it should be high. So because this goes from a high concentration to a low concentration, it doesn't require um, energy in the form of ATP. And active transport doesn't require ATP because it's going from a low concentration to a high concentration because it's going against its concentration gradient. And this in passive transport moves along the concentration gradient. And this is endocytosis and exocytosis. Endocytosis is in which molecules are transported from outside the cell in, into the cell, while exocytosis is where molecules are trans transported from the inside of the cell to the outside of the cell. And in both uh, endocytosis and exocytosis, the vesicles fuse with the plasma membrane to either release molecules into external environment or to transport molecules into the internal environment. So facilitated diffusion, this is basically what um, facilitates our large charge and polar molecules. And these are commonly membrane and channel proteins. And yeah, these basically regulate what comes into and out of the cell. And yeah, next we're gonna be talking about tonicity and osmoregulation. So there's three different types of solutions. There's a hypertonic, a hypertonic solution, isotonic solution, and a hypotonic solution. So our hypotonic solution, it has a high amount of solute, a low amount of water. This means that water is going to move outside the cell, as you can see this diagram here, which will cause the cell to shrivel. A hypotonic solution, it has a low solute and a high amount of water, which causes water to move inside the cell, and this can cause the cell to grow and even burst. An isotonic solution is basically like equilibrium, as it is where the solute and water is the same, and molecules move inside and out of the cell, and the cell does not shrink or grow. <clears throat> and what this is water potential, and this is an equation used for water potential. And as you know, water moves from a low solute concentration to a high solute concentration. And homeostasis is achieved due to the movement of molecules across the membrane. This is our water potential um, equation. And this one is our ionization constant. And because it's sucrose, this is going to be one. 
and this is our molar concentration which is shown here and this is our pressure constant the constant also always remains the same as shown here and and this our temperature in kelvin it's found by adding 273 to our temperature in celsius once you substitute all these in and you multiply them all together you should uh get the answer of 2.44 and these um units cancel out each other so as you can see here these cancel out each other these cancel out each other and these cancel out each other if you multiply it and this is the only one that is not cancelled out by anything so our answer it is in the units of bars in this because it's an open container that has no pressure potential so this would also be its water potential and yeah that's basically it for this unit thanks for watching